Number three, Thomas Wales. Thomas Wales was born in Boston, Massachusetts in June 1952. He attended the Milton Academy, which is a boarding school in Milton, Massachusetts. While he boarded there, his roommate was Joseph Kennedy II, the eldest son of Robert Kennedy. Kennedy would go on to serve as congressman for Massachusetts from 1987 to 1999. When Thomas was 16, he met 16-year-old Elizabeth, who also attended Milton, and they started dating. Thomas went on to Harvard after graduating from Milton. When Thomas was 21, he and Elizabeth got married. After he graduated from Harvard, Thomas attended Hofstra Law School. The same year that Thomas finished law school, Elizabeth gave birth to a son. Two years later, she gave birth to a daughter. In 1983, Thomas was hired by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Seattle, Washington. The family moved into a 1905 Craftsman-style house in a quiet neighborhood named Queen Anne. In January 1995, Something happened that completely altered the course of Thomas's life. At the time, his son was attending a public high school. On January 12th, a 15-year-old student at the school felt like he was being picked on by another student. The 15-year-old boy went home and he grabbed a 9mm handgun. He returned to school and he shot two students. Both were wounded, but they survived the shooting. Thomas's son wasn't involved in the shooting, but the fact that a kid could easily get a gun and shoot other students at school deeply disturbed him. Not long after the shooting, Thomas joined Ceasefire, which is a Washington-based gun control advocacy group. He eventually became the president of Ceasefire, and he held the position for over a decade. In the year 2000, Thomas's wife Elizabeth came out as gay and she wanted to end their 27-year marriage. Elizabeth, who runs her own literary agency, said that it took a while for Thomas to come to terms with everything. Elizabeth said he eventually did and he was supportive of her. She said that they remained best friends after their separation. By the fall of 2001, Thomas had been with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Seattle for 18 years. He prosecuted white-collar crimes like bank fraud. By all accounts, he was incredibly passionate about prosecuting people who abused their privilege. In his 18-year career, Thomas had not lost a single case. On the evening of October 11, 2001, Thomas was supposed to have dinner with his girlfriend, who owned a court reporting business. But earlier that day, he called and canceled their date, saying he had work to do at home. Shortly before 7 p.m., Thomas left his office and drove home. He was living alone in the house in Queen Anne. Elizabeth had moved out when they separated, and their children were away at university in Europe. At 10.40 p.m., gunshots shattered the quiet of the night. Several calls came into 911, and the callers said that the shots came from Thomas's house. First responders raced to the house, and in the office basement of Thomas's home, they found him bleeding to death. Paramedics worked on him for an hour in the office, and then he was transported to the hospital. But sadly, nothing could be done for him. 49-year-old Thomas Wales was pronounced dead at 1.17 a.m. He had been shot four or five times in the back. The FBI has not revealed exactly how many times Thomas was shot. The killer took the gun with him, but left the shells behind. 
The caliber of gun used in the murder was a 380. The killer had gotten into Thomas's backyard, snuck by the security lights, and shot Thomas in the back through a window as he sat at his computer. Since it was 1040 at night, it was dark outside, and Thomas was writing emails in his office with the lights on. The killer would have been able to see Thomas working on his computer, but Thomas would have had no idea that the killer was lurking outside of his window. The neighbor whose backyard backed onto Thomas's backyard said she saw a man walking quickly towards a car just minutes after the gunshot. She gave a description of the man that resulted in this sketch. The FBI was called in and they worked with the Seattle police. They were quickly able to clear the people who are usual suspects in a murder, including his ex-wife, his girlfriend, and his children. Some people thought that Thomas's murder was some type of terrorist attack because he was shot on October 11, 2001, a month after the 9-11 attacks. But Thomas was an attorney who prosecuted white-collar crimes so he seemed like an unlikely choice for a terrorist assassination. The next logical explanation was that he was killed in revenge for a case they prosecuted. While Thomas didn't handle violent crimes, he had sent people to prison, so the police and the FBI thought it was a viable motive. They even had a suspect, a commercial airline pilot named James Anderson. Besides being a pilot, Anderson and a partner owned a company that was converting a military helicopter into a civilian helicopter. Anderson and his partner were going to spend $600,000 converting the helicopter and then they planned to sell it for $1.2 million. In 2000, Thomas filed eight indictments against Anderson and his partner for crimes like mail fraud, a conspiracy to defraud the United States government. The indictments alleged that to get the helicopter certified as a civilian helicopter, Anderson and his partner falsified some records. But then, in June 2001, the charges against Anderson and his partner were dismissed. A witness who was going to testify for the prosecution changed his story and Thomas and his co-counsel did not think that they had enough evidence to prosecute Anderson and his partner. Instead, Anderson's company was charged with a minor violation involving bookkeeping. They pleaded guilty, and they paid a $1,000 fine. Even though the charges were dropped, Anderson was supposedly furious about being charged. He ended up suing the United States government because he claimed he spent $128,000 on legal fees and his reputation was ruined. His suit was ultimately dismissed. Something else that got the FBI's attention is that Anderson is an avid gun enthusiast. After the 9-11 attacks, there was some discussion if pilots should be armed with guns. Thomas who was the president of the gun control advocacy group Ceasefire, spoke out against the idea in a half-hour televised debate. The FBI believes that Anderson became even more furious with Thomas after he spoke out against arming pilots, so he decided to kill Thomas. FBI agents asked Anderson where he was the night of the murder. He said that he went to a movie theater to see 2001 A Space Odyssey with a woman friend. The FBI agents interviewed the woman and she confirmed that they went to the movie. The movie theater that they went to was about a 10 minute drive from Thomas's house. The woman said she left to go to her own home at 9.30 p.m. Anderson said he drove home at 9.30 as well. That was about an hour and ten minutes before Thomas was shot. Anderson said he was home at 10.30 and he called a friend. Anderson's home was about 12 miles from Thomas's home. If Anderson obeyed the speed limits, it would have taken him about 20 minutes to drive from his house 
to Thomas's house. Anderson pointed out that since he made the call at 10.30 on his landline at home, he would not have had enough time to get to Thomas's to shoot him at 10.40. However, an FBI agent who worked on the case said that Anderson could have made the drive in 10 minutes. He said it would have been tight, but it wouldn't have been impossible. The FBI has searched Anderson's houses multiple times and they made him spend eight hours giving them handwriting samples. But the FBI has not found any incriminating evidence, so Anderson has never been charged. According to an agent who worked on the case, one of the biggest problems facing investigators is that Thomas's murder was a nearly perfect crime. The only physical evidence the killer left behind were the bullets and the shells. No DNA or fingerprints were found, so it's hard to physically link anyone to the crime. Then in January 2006, over four years after Thomas's murder, the FBI office in Seattle received a strange letter in the mail. The postmark was January 23, 2006, Las Vegas, Nevada. The FBI address and the return address were both handwritten. The handwriting is sloppy and childlike. The return address is a strip mall in Las Vegas. The FBI noted three things about the return address. The first is that the zip code is incorrect. The writer mixed up the last two digits. He or she wrote 89120 and it is actually 89102. The second thing they noted is that the address is on the same street as an FBI field office. The field office is 1.8 miles from the address. Finally, there is a name on the return address, and that is Gidget. Gidget is the nickname of 17-year-old Francis Lawrence, a fictional character first introduced in the 1957 novel Gidget, The Little Girl with Big Ideas by Frederick Honer. The character's nickname, Gidget, is a combination of the words girl and midget. The book was adapted into the 1959 film, Gidget. The movie stars Sandra Dee as the titular character and is widely considered to be the first beach party movie. Seven years after the movie was released, the book was adapted into a TV series that aired for one season on ABC starting in September 1966. Sally Field starred as Gidget. The original novel and the adaptations are coming of age stories based in the California surf culture. The FBI is not sure if the name has any significance. In the envelope was a type letter. The letter was written using short disjointed sentences that invoke the style of 1950s detective novels. The entire letter has not been released, but the portion that was made public reads, Ray Thomas C. Wales. Okay, so I was broken between jobs. I got an anonymous call offering X amount of dollars to shoot the guy, so I drove to Seattle to do the job. I did not even know his name. Just got laid off from a job. Nice talking lady. I didn't know her name. She called me, talked to me by my name, and asked if I needed some money. I agreed to pursue the matter. Hell, I was going bankrupt. Go to Seattle. Heck, I lived there once. No big deal. Hang out in this guy's backyard. She even gave me the address. Stop off at a place, pick up her gun, and drop it off at a specified location when you are done. Then you will be directed to where your money is. The wife was out of town. I had no witnesses here. I was curious about who knew me so well. I used cash to pay for all my expenses to avoid an audit trail. No cell phone. I was directed to a place to pick up the gun they wanted me to use and an address. The gun was there. I drove to the address and then parked some distance away, north of downtown. 
I kind of camped out in the backyard of this house and waited for the guy to settle in at his computer. Once he was there, I took careful aim. I shot two or possibly more times and watched him collapse. I absurdly waited a few minutes and then left. I was sure he was dead. Retracing my steps, I dropped off the gun, found my money, and returned to Vegas. I feel bad about it, but I needed the money and there were no witnesses. I really don't know who fronted the money, but the X amount of dollars was there and I sure needed it. The police checked the envelope for DNA, but it appeared that the envelope was sealed with a sponge and the stamps were self-adhesive. It's also believed that the letter was typed and printed at a copy shop. The letter does not reveal anything about the murder that wasn't already public, but the FBI still thinks it's possible that either the killer or someone involved with the crime wrote the letter. The FBI thinks that the writer wrote the letter and mailed it to possibly throw investigators off course. Or it's possible that he or she is setting up false evidence if the case were ever to go to trial. The person charged with a crime could point to the letter as evidence that they are innocent because a hitman hired by a woman had already taken credit for the murder. The police investigate Anderson's records and they discover that he had a layover in Las Vegas around the time that the letter was sent. However, just like the murder, the FBI has never physically been able to connect Anderson to the letter. Anderson has adamantly denied being involved in the murder, but he swears he didn't send the letter. He says that the accusations have been devastating to him, both financially and emotionally. In February 2018, the FBI and Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein made an announcement about the case. Friends and family of Thomas Wales were hoping that they were announcing an arrest. Unfortunately, that wasn't the announcement. Instead, they announced that the reward for information leading to an arrest is now over $1.5 million. Not long after the announcement, the Seattle Times published a quote from an FBI official who is close to the case. The official said that the FBI has found strong evidence that a hitman was probably used in the murder. But there have been no arrests since the announcement. The FBI and the Attorney General's office said that prosecuting Thomas's Wales killer remains a top priority. If Thomas Wales was murdered because of his work as a U.S. attorney, he would have a unique distinction. He would be the first federal prosecutor in the history of the United States to be killed in the line of duty. Number 2. Alessia and Livia Shep Nadia Shep was born in July 1963 in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. A month before his second birthday, his family moved to Switzerland. He grew up in Switzerland and he became an engineer. At some point, he started dating Irina Lucini, an Italian-born woman who worked as an intellectual property lawyer. In early 2004, Irina found out that she was pregnant. In July of that year, they were married in the town hall in Ascoli Pacciano, Italy. On October 7, 2004, Irina gave birth to two daughters, Alessia and Livia. In 2006, the family moved into a nice home in saint sulpice which is a suburb of Lausanne, Switzerland. Not long after moving in, Irina noticed a change in Mattias. He had become very demanding, and he only thought about himself. He also thought that he was always the victim. It eventually got to be too much for Irina, and she asked Mattias to move out. They set up a custodial schedule, where Mattias would get the twins two days a week, and every second weekend. Mattias wasn't happy with the separation. He was hoping that he and Irina could work things out. But Irina made it clear 
that they would never get back together. On Thursday, January 27, 2011, she sent him an email saying she wanted a divorce. The next day, Irina dropped off Alessi and Livia, who were both six, at a ballet class. Matthias picked them up because it was his weekend to have the twins. Matthias was supposed to drop them off at Irina's house at 5 p.m. on Sunday. But on Sunday afternoon, Matthias sent Irina a text message saying he would drop them off at school on Monday morning. Irina said that was fine, but then she got a bad feeling. At about 6 p.m., she drove by Matthias' house. She saw that no one was home, and she found that odd. So she went inside, and what she found alarmed her. It was Matthias' will, which was handwritten, and placed in a spot where it was easily found. She called Matthias' friends and family, but they didn't know where he or the twins were. She then called the police. Irina said the police were slow to act, and Switzerland didn't have an Amber Alert type system. On Thursday, February 3rd, four days after Matthias, Alessia, and Livia vanished, Irina received some shocking news. Matthias was found in Cherinola, which is a town in southeast Italy. He was dead. He had thrown himself in front of a train. The girls were not with him. Around the same time that the news of Matthias' death reached Irina, she received a disturbing postcard written by Matthias and several envelopes with money in them. The postcard was sent from Marseille, France. In the postcard, Matthias sounded despondent. He wrote, now is the time to finish it. Matthias also mailed her money in seven envelopes. It was a total of 5,000 euros, or about 6,800 US dollars. The money was withdrawn from different ATMs in Marseille. Then Irina received a letter that was sent from Bari, Italy on the day that Matthias killed himself. In the letter, he wrote, the children rest in peace, they have not suffered. The police investigate what Matthias did in the four days that he and the twins were missing. Before he absconded, Matthias did searches on the internet for firearms, poison, and suicide. He also looked up the timetables for ferries. On Sunday night, Around the time he should have dropped off the girls at their mother's home, Matthias crossed the Swiss border into France. It's not known if the twins were with him. The last confirmed sighting of Alessi and Olivia was Sunday afternoon. They were seen playing in front of their father's house. On Monday, Matthias sent the postcard and he withdrew money in Marseille, France. In total, he withdrew 7,000 euros, and he sent 5,000 of the euros to Irina. That night, he bought three tickets for the night ferry from Marseille to Propriano, which is on the French island of Corsica. Alessia and Livia's names were on the passenger manifest. There are conflicting reports about what happened the next morning when the ferry reached Propriano. Some witnesses said they saw Matthias with the twins that morning, while other people said he was alone when he got off the ferry. Later that day, Matthias bought one ticket for a ferry leaving Bastia, which is about 110 miles from Propiano. The ferry was heading to Toulon, France. Two days later, at 10.47 p.m., Matthias threw himself in front of a train outside of Cherinola, Italy. Because of the postcard and the letter, and the fact that Matthias sent Irina money, many people believe that Matthias killed his daughters. The police in Switzerland, France, and Italy have all searched for the bodies of the girls, but no trace of them has ever been found. One theory is that Matthias, through the girls, dead or alive, 
off the ferry that was heading to Propriano. Since their bodies have never been found, it's never been confirmed that Maddie has killed them. Then in 2014, there was an odd twist in the case. A popular television show in Italy which focuses on missing people, called Kilo Visto, which translates to Who Has Seen, received a mysterious letter pertaining to the disappearance of Alessi and Livia. The writer didn't give his or her name, but they said they worked for a printer in Italy. The writer claimed that the printer had false documents made for the twins. The documents were then used to transport the twins to Canada. The twins were split up, and one was supposedly living in Ottawa, Ontario, and the other twin was living about 80 miles away in La Chute, Quebec. The producers of Kilo Visto turned the letter over to the Italian police, but the Italian police did not contact the police in Ottawa. The Ottawa police said without an official complaint, they could not start an investigation. So they have never investigated the claims made in the letter. The reporter from Kilo Visto said the show was going to hire a private investigator to look into the claims made in the letter. But if they did follow through and hire a private investigator, and if that private investigator found anything, it is unknown. Irina hopes that Alessi and Livia are still alive. She doesn't think that Mattias would have taken out his rage for her on their daughters. After her daughters went missing, Irina stopped living in the home that she shared with Mattias and their daughters, but she couldn't bring herself to sell the house. She has not sought to have her daughters declared dead, and she is not sure if she'll ever be ready to do that. On October 7, 2011, which was the girl's seventh birthday, Irina launched Missing Children Switzerland. It is a foundation that has lobbied to get an Amber Alert type system implemented in Switzerland, and it helps educate the police on parental abductions. If Alessi and Livia are still alive, they would be 14 years old at the time of this video. Number 1. The Axeman of New Orleans In 1919, three Maggio brothers and one of their wives lived in apartments behind a grocery store in New Orleans, Louisiana. Jake and Andrew Maggio lived in one apartment, a 58-year-old Joseph Maggio lived with his 51-year-old wife, Catherine, in the other apartment. They had all immigrated from Italy years earlier. The grocery store that they lived behind was run by Joseph and Catherine. On the night of May 22, 1918, Jake and Andrew went out drinking, and they returned home late. Sometime early in the morning, Jake was awoken by the sound of groaning in the apartment next door. He got Andrew up, and they went to investigate. They found a panel cut out of the door that led to the outside. They entered their brother and sister-in-law's apartment, and they were shocked by what they found. Catherine was dead. She had several deep cuts on her face and her chest, and her throat was slit. Joseph had severe head injuries. He was alive when his brothers found him, but he died before help arrived. In the bathtub, there was a bloody axe. The axe belonged to the deceased couple. In a neighbor's yard, the police found a straight razor. Andrew was a barber, and the razor belonged to him. He brought it home the evening before because he wanted to fix a nick in it. The police also found bloodstained clothes that were worn by the killer. The police believe that after attacking the couple, the killer changed into clean clothes. A doctor performed autopsies on both bodies. He believed that Catherine had gone out of bed and she encountered her killer while she was standing. She was slashed seven times with the razor, but she wasn't struck with the axe. 
Joseph was hit twice in the head with the axe, and his throat was also cut. The doctor thought that they had been attacked several hours before they were found. About a mile from the crime scene, the detectives found a message written in chalk on the sidewalk. There are different reports to exactly what the message read, but it was something to the effect of, Mrs. Joseph Maggio will sit up tonight, just like Mrs. Tony. This message reminded the police, the newspapers, and the public of a murder that happened nearly six years to the day of the murder of the Maggios. Tony Sambra was a 27-year-old Italian grocer who lived and worked in New Orleans. He lived in an apartment behind the grocery store with his wife, Joanna. Many people who knew the couple called Joanna Mrs. Tony. In May 1912, Joanna was pregnant with the couple's second child. They had an 11-month-old son named Jake. At about 2 a.m. on May 16, 1912, a man entered Tony and Joanna's bedroom. The man fired five bullets into Tony and then calmly walked out of their home. Nothing was stolen and the murder seemed motiveless. But that wasn't the only attack on Italian grocers in recent years in New Orleans. At about 3 a.m. on August 13, 1910, Less than two years before Tony Simbra was shot to death, someone broke into the grocery store owned by August Carudi. August and his wife Harriet and their sons lived in an apartment behind the store. The intruder broke a window panel on the door, but then pried the door open. The intruder was armed with a meat cleaver that he stole from a butcher shop six blocks away from the family's home. The intruder walked into August and Harriet's bedroom and chopped August twice with the knife. Harriet woke up during the attack and saw a man standing beside their bed. He demanded money, so Harriet gave him some, and then he left the apartment. Once he was outside, he rolled and smoked a cigarette. Then he put on his shoes and he walked off into the night. August was taken to the hospital, and despite being hit in the head and the chest with a meat cleaver, the wounds weren't too severe, and he survived. Harriet said that the attacker looked like he was in his mid-thirties. He was 5'6 with broad shoulders. He had dark hair, a thick nose and thick lips, and he was clean-shaven. His voice was rough and husky. He was wearing black pants, a blue workman's shirt, and a black derby hat. Unfortunately, Harriet's description of the attacker did not lead to an arrest. A month after the attack, on the night of September 19, 1910, 42-year-old Joseph Rosito and his 36-year-old wife, Conchetta, who were the children of Italian immigrants, went to bed in their apartment behind the grocery store which they own in a rough neighborhood in New Orleans. In the early morning hours of September 20th, a man picked up a large butcher knife called a meat axe from a shed that was behind the grocery store. He got into the couple's apartment by climbing through an open window and he found the couple sleeping in bed. First he started hacking Conchetta and then he attacked Joseph. The attacker then fled into the darkness of the night. Even though he had been hit twice in the face with a meat axe, Joseph was able to get out of bed and he fired his revolver twice into the air to alert his neighbors. His neighbors were awoken and they called for help. Both Conchetta and Joseph were taken to the hospital and amazingly, they survived the attack. They were horribly scarred and Joseph lost vision in one of his eyes. Nearly nine months later, the police were called to a grocery store that belonged to a newlywed couple named Joe and Mary Davi. Joe, who was 26, and Mary, who was 16, had immigrated from Italy when they were children. 
On the night of June 26, 1911, Mary, who was pregnant, was tired and she went to bed early. Joe went to bed at around 11 p.m. At 5 o'clock the next morning, a customer came to the store and found it locked. He knocked on the door of the couple's living quarters and Mary answered the door. She seemed dazed since she had blood on her face. Sensing that something was deeply wrong, the customer got into the living quarters and he went to the couple's bedroom. Joe had suffered a severe head injury and his breathing was labored. He was taken to the hospital and he survived for 30 hours before passing away. Mary said that she woke up in the middle of the night and there was a man in the room. The man demanded money and Mary said she didn't have any. The man then picked up a coffee mug and smashed it into the side of her head, knocking her unconscious. She said that she did not get a good look at the man. Even though the killer demanded money, he did not steal anything. The murder weapon wasn't found, but it's believed that it was a meat cleaver, just like the first two attacks. Then, exactly 11 months after Joe Davi was killed, Tony Scrimbaugh was shot to death in his bed. Then six years and six days after Tony's murder, Joseph and Catherine Maggio were killed in their home with an axe. Unfortunately, the Maggios were only the first victims, in a new string of murders in New Orleans. On the morning of June 26, 1918, a delivery man arrived at the grocery store that belonged to Louis Bessmer. When he got to the store, he found it closed, and he thought that was very odd. He tried to open both the front door and the back door, and he found them both locked. He pounded on the door, and Bessmer came to the door. His face was covered in blood. Bessmer let the delivery man into the store, and the delivery man made his way to the apartment that was at the back of the store. In the bedroom, he found Bessmer's living girlfriend, Harriet Lowe. Like Bessmer, she was bleeding from the head. She was barely conscious. The delivery man found help. Investment and Lowe were transported to the hospital. Close to the bed, the police found a bloody axe handle and a rusty axe head. The axe, which belonged to Bessemer, had been broken in the attack. Bessemer had only suffered minor wounds and he was released from the hospital after six days. Lowe's wounds were much more severe and for several weeks, she was in and out of consciousness. After a few weeks, it looked like she would survive, but she was disfigured and her face was paralyzed. The police searched Bessemer's home and they found letters written in Yiddish, German, and Russian. The letters led the police to suspect that Bessemer was a German spy. When Lowe started to stay conscious for longer periods of time, the police asked her if Bessemer was a spy, and she said yes. So Bessemer was arrested. The problem was that Lowe was delusional a lot of the time. After a short investigation, the police concluded that Bessemer was not a spy, and he was released two days after he was arrested. Two months after the attack, Lowe underwent surgery that was supposed to repair her paralyzed face. On August 3rd, 1918, two days after the surgery, her health took a turn for the worse, and she died. On her deathbed, she supposedly accused Bessemer of attacking her. Besides thinking he was a spy, the police thought that Bessemer could have been the person who attacked Lowe. They thought this because his wounds were much less severe than Lowe's injuries so he may have injured himself to make it look like they were both attacked. Also, when the delivery man came to the grocery store, he found all the doors locked. There were also no signs of a break-in. 
The police thought that the logical explanation was that someone inside the home committed the attack. Specifically, Vesper may have staged the attack to make it look like the work of the Axeman. The attack on Vesmir Lowe were different from previous attacks in two significant ways. The first is that the earlier attacks happened in the apartments behind grocery stores in sparsely populated areas. While Vesmir's grocery store was in a densely populated area. Secondly, all the other victims were Italian or of Italian descent. Vesmir was Polish and Lowe wasn't Italian either. Not long after Lowe's death, Vesmer was arrested and charged with her murder. On the night of August 5th, 1918, hours after Harriet Lowe passed away, 28-year-old Anna Schneider put her three children to bed in the home that she shared with her husband in New Orleans. Schneider, who was eight months pregnant, then got into bed herself. Her husband worked the night shift at the South Pacific Wharf, so he wasn't home that night. At 2 a.m., Schneider's sister, who lived next door, heard a scream coming from Schneider's apartment. Her sister's husband went to check on Schneider, and he found her bleeding from the head. She was conscious, and she said she didn't know what happened to her. Not long after her brother-in-law found her, Schneider lost consciousness. Two days later, she was alive, but she was slipping in and out of consciousness. That's when she gave birth to a healthy baby girl. Schneider fully regained consciousness not long after the baby was delivered. She said she only had fleeting memories of the birth. The police weren't sure if the attack was related to the Axe Band murders, because it was quite different than the other attacks. Schneider, who was not Italian, was alone when she was assaulted. The Axeman had just never attacked a single woman. He usually got into the bedrooms of couples, and the man was usually the target. Also, Schneider wasn't attacked with an axe. Instead, she was bashed in the head with a bedside lamp. There was money missing from Snyder's husband's wallet, but the attacker had missed a tin with $100 in it. So it was thought that Snyder was attacked by a robber who became startled when she woke up. He grabbed the closest object he could use as a weapon, which was the bedside lamp, and he hit her in the face with it. He then ran away instead of ensuring that she was dead. Schneider was released from the hospital after a few weeks. Eight-year-old Joseph Romano lived with his two adult nieces behind a grocery store that was run by another one of his nieces. Even though Romano was an elderly man, he worked as a barber. Five nights after Schneider was attacked, on August 10, 1918, at about 3 a.m., one of his nieces heard a commotion coming from his room and then she heard groaning. She went into the room and she found her uncle bleeding from a large head wound. He was rushed to the hospital, but he died shortly after arriving. The doctors had time to ask him if he knew who attacked him and he said he didn't see the attacker. Romano had been killed with a single blow to the head with an ax. The ax was found beside his bed after that, the Axeman went quiet for the rest of 1918. On March 10, 1919, seven months after the last murder, the neighbors of the Cordomiglia family, who lived in New Orleans, heard screams coming from their house. The Cordomiglia family consisted of Charles, his wife Rosie, and their two-year-old daughter, Mary. Charles had immigrated from Italy and Rosie was born in Louisiana. Two of the first people to reach the family's home was Orlando Giordano, an elderly grocer, and his 18-year-old son, Frank. They found the family in bed. 
Rosie was holding Mary in her arms. They had all been hit with an axe. Charles and Rosie were rushed to the hospital, but it was too late for their daughter Mary. Sadly, she was pronounced dead at the scene. Against all odds, Charles and Rosie survived the attack. The police interviewed them, and Rosie said that Orlando and Frank Giordano attacked them. But there were several problems with Rosie's accusation. For example, Orlando was too old and feeble to have attacked the family. Also, a panel on the door was missing, and it's believed that the attacker climbed through the hole left by the missing panel. Frank was a large 18-year-old man, and he would have not been able to fit through the door panel. Also, Charles said that he had never seen his attacker before, and he knew Orlando and Frank quite well. In fact, the Giordanos and the Cormiglia family were in the middle of a dispute when the family was attacked. The police investigated the Giordanos, but they had a problem tying them to the attack. On March 14th, four days after the family was attacked, the newspaper, the Times Picayune, received a neatly handwritten letter from someone claiming to be the Axe Man. Two days later, the newspaper decided to publish the letter. It reads, Hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal of New Orleans, they have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axe Man. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe be smeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the axe man. I don't think there is any need for such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as the most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wish, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, and the worst, for I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is, I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions, that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then, so much better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse. Hoping that thou will publish this, that it may go well with thee, I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or realm of fantasy. And then the letter was signed off, the Axe Man. Some people were terrified by the letter, and parties were thrown on the night indicated in the letter to keep the Axe Man away. 
Other people did not think that the letter was from the Axeman. They thought the Axeman was a working class man and the writing in the letter was too sophisticated for a working class man. Instead, they thought the letter was probably written by a local musician and businessman. After the letter was published, he debuted a new song called The Mysterious Axe Man's Jazz, Don't Scare Me Papa. Whether the letter was really from the Axe Man or not, there were no axe murders on the Tuesday night indicated in the letter. Two months after the attack on the Cormiglia family, Orlando and Frank Giordano were indicted for the murder of two-year-old Mary Cormiglia. On May 26, 1919, about three weeks after they were indicted, both father and son were found guilty. Orlando was sentenced to life in prison and Frank was sentenced to death. Meanwhile, Louis Bessmer continued to sit in prison while he awaited trial for the murder of his mistress, Harriet Lowe. In June 1919, nine months after Harriet died, Bessmer went to trial. He was ultimately acquitted of all charges. At 3.30 on the morning of August 3, 1919, 19-year-old Sarah Lawman awoke to find a man standing over her bed. She screamed and the man ran out of her house. Her parents came into her room and they thought she was unharmed. But then later, she complained about a pain in her head. Her mother examined her, and she found a small cut behind her ear. The police were called, and when they arrived at the family's home, they asked to see their axe. When her father went to retrieve it, he found it missing. Later that day, it was found a few blocks away from the family's home. When Lamu was examined by a doctor, he said that the injury behind her ear wasn't caused by an axe. Instead, she was injured by a round, blunt instrument. But what that weapon was is unknown to this day. It's also a mystery as to why the intruder stole the family's axe. Mike and Esther Pipitone owned a grocery store in New Orleans and they lived behind the store. The last weekend of October 1919 was a busy one for the couple. A block away from their store, there was a circus, and many people stopped into the store to buy drinks and snacks. When they retired to their bed on the night of October 27th, they were exhausted. Hours later, at about 1.40 a.m., their daughter ran out into the street, screaming and looking for help. She found a police officer patrolling the streets, and she led him back to her home. Her 35-year-old father, Mike, was bleeding badly from a wound in his head. Hours later, he was pronounced dead. He had been hit three times in the head with an axe. Mike's wife, Esther, who was unharmed, was interviewed by the police. She said she woke up and she saw two intruders. One was tall and skinny, and the other one was short with broad shoulders. For this reason, the police weren't sure if Mike was a victim of the axe man. All the other surviving victims said they were attacked by one man. There was also a possible motive for Mike's murder, unlike the other murders, which just seem random or possibly racially motivated. Nine years earlier, Mike's father had killed a member of the Mafia, known as the Black Hand. So it was thought that Mike was killed in retaliation. The police thought it was possible that the attacks were part of a racketeering scheme, or they were committed to intimidate the Italian community in New Orleans. One thing that was determined was that Orlando and Frank Giordano weren't involved in the attacks. In May 1919, they were convicted of killing two-year-old Mary Cormiglia. In December 1920, they were released from prison because Mary's mother, Rosie, 
recanted her accusations. After Mike Pipitone's murder in October 1919, the axe attacks in New Orleans came to an end. Then just over two years after his murder, in December 1921, a suspect in the axe man attacks emerged and he had a connection to the Black Hand. It all started in the wake of Mike Pipitone's murder. Mike's widow, Esther, was having problems supporting her six children who were all under the age of 12. She ended up having some of her children move in with other family members and she put other ones up for adoption. In January 1921, Esther traveled to Los Angeles, California to attend the wedding of her niece, Rosa. Rosa was the daughter of Esther's late sister, Jenny. Jenny had died in the 1918 flu epidemic. At the wedding, Esther became reacquainted with Jenny's widower, Angelo Albano. After Jenny died, Angelo had moved from New Orleans to Los Angeles, where he set up and ran a successful grocery store. Jenny was in her early 30s, and Angelo was twice her age, but that didn't stop them from getting married in September 1921. Just eight weeks later, on October 27th, Angelo walked out the door to go to the market, and he didn't return. Esther reported him missing. In the weeks after he disappeared, Esther tried her best to continue on with her life. This included caring for Angelo's elderly father. At around noon on December 5th, 1921, just over a month after Angelo disappeared, a man walked into Esther's house. The man spoke with a thick Italian accent and he had scars on his face. Esther recognized him from New Orleans. His name was Joseph Mumphrey, and he was a member of the Black Hand. Mumphrey demanded $500 from Esther. She told him that she didn't have that type of money. He told her that if she didn't get him the money, then he would kill her, just like he had killed Angelo. Then he hinted that he had a gun in the pocket of his pants. Esther told Mumphrey to wait, and then she went into another room. When Esther came back into the room where Mumphrey was standing, she started shooting at him with a revolver. She missed with her first shot, but her second one was a hit. Mumphrey got out of the house and tried to pull out his gun, but he became tangled in his jacket. He fell down the front steps as Esther kept shooting him. When Esther ran out of bullets, she dropped the revolver and then went back inside. She came back outside moments later with a second revolver and pumped six more bullets into Mumphrey. After the shooting, Esther's niece ran and got a police officer and Esther was arrested. The police charged her with murder because they didn't think the shooting was self-defense because Mumphrey had been shot 11 times, including three times in the back. Esther went to trial in April 1922. Her lawyer told the court that Mumphrey was a gangster who had served time for attempted murder. He was also a suspect in the murder of several people, including both of Esther's husbands. It turned out that when Esther's second husband, Angelo, moved from New Orleans to Los Angeles, he had been partners with Monfrey, but then Angelo dissolved the business relationship. The jury quickly found Esther not guilty. The body of Angelo Albano has never been found. After Monfrey was killed, the police and the newspapers in New Orleans identified him as a suspect in the axe murders. But modern day investigators do not think that he was the axe man. Notably, Mumphrey was either in prison or he wasn't in New Orleans when several of the murders were committed. These investigators also don't think that the attacks were committed by the mafia. 
Usually, members of the Mafia don't attack women and children. Also, the primary motivation behind many of the Mafia's crimes is financial gain, and not much was stolen from any of the living quarters or the grocery stores. Investigators aren't even convinced that all 11 attacks were connected. Two major outliers are Anna Schneider and Sarah Lawman. The Axeman usually attack couples, and the man seemed to be the focus of the attack. In most cases, the men were Italian or of Italian descent, and they lived in the apartment attached to the grocery store which they ran. Schneider and Lawman were attacked, but not killed, while they were alone in bed. Also, neither were Italian, nor were they married to Italian men, and they were not associated with the grocery business and neither woman was attacked with an axe. However, since the axe man was never caught, it's hard to know what attacks he committed and which he didn't. Besides Mumphrey, another suspect in the New Orleans axe slings is a serial killer who was never caught called the Southern Pacific Axe Man. The Southern Pacific Axe Man is suspected of killing around 52 people in Louisiana, Texas, in Mississippi between November 1909 and November 1912. Just like the Axeman of New Orleans, the Southern Pacific Axeman attacked people in the middle of the night while they were sleeping in bed. Nearly all the murders happened along the Southern Pacific Railway. New Orleans is also a stop on the railway. Also, the timelines don't conflict with each other. The first Southern Pacific Axeman murder happened in November 1909 in Rain, Louisiana. Ten months later, in August 1910, the first suspected New Orleans Axeman attack happened. A month later, there was another attack in New Orleans. About four months after that, in January 1911, an attack associated with the Southern Pacific Axeman happened in Crowley, Louisiana. This was followed by another Southern Pacific Axeman attack in February 1911 in Lafayette, Louisiana. A month after that, the Southern Pacific Axeman struck again. This attack happened in San Antonio, Texas, which is also on the Southern Pacific Railway. Five months later, Joe Davy was killed in his bed in New Orleans. In November 1911, Another family in Lafayette was attacked with an axe. On the night of January 19, 1912, a family in Crowley, Louisiana was attacked, and then two days later, there was another attack over 50 miles away in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Both massacres are attributed to the Southern Pacific Axe Man. A month later, there was an attack in Beaumont, Texas. This was followed by an axe attack in Gildon, Texas on March 27, 1912. Just a few weeks later, on April 9th, a family in San Antonio was killed with an axe. A month after that, Tony Simbra was shot to death in his bed in New Orleans. Tony was the only victim to be shot. His murder is considered linked to the New Orleans Axe Man murders because he was an Italian grocer and because of the message that was written on the sidewalk near the Maggio's crime scene that seemingly referenced his wife. After Simbra's murder, the killings in New Orleans came to a stop, but the attacks on families who lived near the Southern Pacific Railway continued. On August 16, 1912, there was an attack on a family in San Antonio. Finally, there was a family killed with an axe in Philadelphia, Mississippi on November 12, 1912. Then the Southern Pacific Axeman went quiet. Five and a half years later, the Axeman of New Orleans murders began with the axe slings of Joseph and Catherine Maggio. There were several significant differences between the two strings of Axeman killings. The first is that the target of many of the New Orleans attacks seemed to be the man living in the home. 
whereas the Southern Pacific Axe Man wiped out or tried to wipe out entire families. Some houses he targeted didn't have a man living in them, and single mothers and their children were the ones who were attacked. Also, none of the victims were Italian. If there was a man living in the house, he was either black or mulatto. In a few cases, the matriarchs were white, but none of them were Italian or of Italian descent. Besides the differences in victims' profiles, some people don't believe that the Southern Pacific Axe Man and the New Orleans Axe Man are the same person because of the gap in time between the murders. The first Southern Pacific Axe Man attacks took place in November 1909 and then the majority happened between January 1911 and November 1912. There were four attacks in New Orleans that happened around the same time. One occurred in August 1910, another one happened a month later in September 1910. These were followed by a murder in June 1911, and the fourth one happened in May 1912. But most of the attacks in New Orleans occurred between May 1918 and October 1919. That is a gap of five and a half years between the Southern Pacific Axe murders and the latter New Orleans Axe murders. But it's important to point out that it's unclear if the first four attacks that happened in New Orleans between 1910 and 1912 are connected to the latter Axeman murders that started in May 1918, six years after the original string of murders. The four earlier attacks in New Orleans were different from both strings of Axeman attacks because none of the victims were attacked with an axe. The first three attacks were probably committed with butcher knives while the May 19th victim was shot. So while there are similarities between the strings of murders, there are also a lot of differences. So this makes it difficult to know if one killer was responsible for all the killings or if it was the work of several killers. It may be possible that one killer is responsible for the murders in New Orleans that happened between 1909 and 1912, and then another killer was responsible for the Southern Pacific Axe murders, then a third killer was responsible for the Axe murders in New Orleans that happened between 1918 and 1919. It's also possible that there were more than three killers. Unfortunately, since all the murders happened over a century ago, we will probably never know who the Axe Man of New Orleans was and how many victims he truly claimed. For more information on the Southern Pacific Axe Man, please watch our video Three Unsolved Mysteries with Strange Written Clues Part 4, which we'll link to in the next few seconds. Thank you so much for watching today's video, hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please go to criminalist.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, to find out about an exclusive podcast. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.